Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Let us start our uh, lecture today. So last time we was trying to solve this equation, right? Uh, so you're gonna, you have to find a function uh, u such that um, for a given function f, you need to find this under the condition that u at zero and u at one, they're both zero. Right, so this is an elliptic equation, and the way we solve it is to write out the weak form. The weak form, which means that you multiply both sides by a, a test function u and you integrate. And then you're gonna get something like this. Right, so you write out the weak form, and this is true for all of the v in S01. Um, and by Lux mean gram theorems, you know that there is a solution, uh, and the solution is unique. It's, it's unique. Um, for this equation style, right? So by so first you you use the Luxman graph theorem to show that okay this equation star has a unique solution and this solution is uh, has a use uh, has a solution and this solution is unique. All right. So and the second thing is to approximate the solution. You you want to use finite element method. All right. So. The whole thing is the combination of two steps. First, you show that this equation has a, a solution and the solution is unique, and you approximate this solution by uh, a solution uh, UH. Uh, um, and this solution UH is, is not far from this solution U, right? So it's, it's going to be of order H. Right, so, uh, so, uh, so when you send this h to zero, the the approximation u s is going to u, right? So this is the whole idea of the whole thing, right? So, so you see that when you remove, when you put this term into the equation, things become more complicated because if you remove this red term, then you can solve this equation exactly by just integrating both sides. All right. Now my question is okay. Uh, what happens if you replace this red one by something like minus ux? I just change the, the plus one to the minus one, right? I just change the plus one to the minus one. What happened? So we explained in the previous class that in this case, the bilinear form will be this guy, except that here you replace the plus by the minus, right? So the bilinear form will be uh, right. So basically, when you replace this plus term plus u by minus u, the bilinear form will change this plus into the minus. Right, and then, and then, and then you don't have coactivity anymore. And this is not going to give you alpha. Right, so this is not going to you the coactivity, no coactivity. And all of the things that we learn is broken down, right? So this is a much harder problem. And of course, uh, um, of course, you have to, to understand the, 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 the underlying uh, reason um, for the Luxman Ram theorem to work in order to, to start creating a, a new um, algorithm to solve this equation. All right, any questions? All right, so my next question for you is the following. 
Now I don't I don't like this one half. I replace it by one. Uh, I don't like the minus u. I replace it by minus one half. Right. So now I replace it by minus one half. And then I have the same kind of thing. Can we solve it? My last mean gram and finite element method. Right? So I don't I don't like minus one, minus u, I replace it by minus one half of u. Is there a chance that I can solve this equation by using the finite element method? Yes, no. So, so why, why minus u didn't work? Right? Here, I replace uh, this guy by minus u. This didn't work because there is no coexivity, right? So, so, so then my, sim, my, my questions become simpler. Do you have coexivity for this guy? Do we have coexivity? No. So, so now you have what? You have BUU. -U. This is equal to the integral from zero to one of U prime square dx. And here I have minus one half integral from zero to one of UX square, right? So can I find alpha so that this is bigger than one, uh, the integral from alpha to zero to alpha of this guy? Is there, is there an alpha? So this is coercivity, right? The coercivity say that, coercivity say that, okay, there is an alpha such that BU is greater than alpha times the norm of U in H01. The norm of U in H01 is this guy, right? Can I find this alpha? Right, the coercivity means that I replace V by U and then BU U will be integral from zero to one of U prime X square dx minus one half integral from zero to one of U X square. And this is bigger than alpha uh, times the integral from zero to one of U prime X square dx, all right? All right, so, so can I find this alpha? Now, I am gonna have one minus, so, so this is equal, yes, um, yes, so Liu just said that yes, why? Yes, is the, the very good answer. Right, to see this, you wanna throw this alpha to the left-hand side. You're gonna have one minus alpha u prime x squared dx is bigger than one half u x squared, right? I throw this alpha to the left-hand side. I have one minus alpha integral from zero to one of u prime x squared dx. And this is going to be bigger than one half, one, one half, of the integral from zero to one of u square. Right, so, so Liu idea is to use Sobolev inequality, and this is perfect, right? So how do you use Sobolev inequality? You just have to choose alpha to be one half, right? So you choose alpha to be one half, then, then you, you have what? One half of, so you have, according to the Sobolev inequality, you have that the integral from zero to one of ux, u prime x square is going to be bigger than the integral from zero to one of ux square, right? Uh, right, so, so then, then I gonna, so, so when alpha is one half, then this is one half and this is one half, all right? So alpha is one half. I explain again. So in this equation, I replace the coefficient here to be one half, all right? 
So my question to you is, okay, can I solve this equation using finite element method and Luxmi gram? The answer is yes. Because when you, you consider the bilinear form, which comes from the weak form, you're gonna get the integral from zero to one of u prime v prime minus one half, the integral from zero to one u x v x. Do we have coercivity in this case? The answer is yes. So you have b u, u will be the integral from zero to one of u prime x squared dx, and then this become one, minus one half, the integral from zero to one of u x squared, and this is going to be bigger than alpha, the integral from zero to one of u prime x squared dx, all right? Right, so I throw this alpha to, 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 to the left hand side. I have my one minus alpha the integral from zero to one of u prime x squared dx is going to be bigger than one half integral from zero to one of u x squared, right? So, uh, so you uh, suggest that um, when you choose alpha to be one half, you can use overlap inequality, which is true because, because you can bound an integral of u prime from below by an integral of u, right? And then and then if you put one half, then it's fine, right? So in this case, alpha is one half. So we have coercivity, all right? So, so, so from the example that I show you, uh, the coefficient in front of the u is extremely important because without that, you don't have coercivity and nothing works, right? So if someone asks you to call this one, okay, you say that, okay, we don't have a unique solution you don't have uh, uh, so you don't know in advance if um, uh, if there is a, a solution which is unique or not so if you don't know if there is a solution then you like, cannot in, implement the code right because you you look into the luxembourg gram theorem this is violated there is no unique solution there could be no solution there could be two solution when there there could be two solution then no numerical scheme have you to solve it because you have to identify which is the solution that you are looking at, all right? So the coefficient of u is very important. Now, now to, to get you the, the big picture, right? So, so um, uh, I'm gonna go over a few more examples, right? So now I'm gonna consider this equation in which the coefficient of u is a, uh, is, uh, is uh is variational right so this is to the power uh, 2020 right ux and this is going to be fx so this you have to solve it for all of x in zero one and then u at zero and u at one they're both zero right so when you look into this equation can you tell me if you have a unique solution or not? Yes, no? No, you don't know. So, so do you have CVD? Uh, why you don't have coercivity? The answer is yes, right? So, so do you say that this is uh, you don't have coercivity? But but basically, uh, uh, the, yeah, yes, there is a there is coercivity in this case. Uh, but it's still encouraging to 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 participate in our uh, discussion. So, so this is the, the form, all right? So this is the bilinear form. When you write out a weak form, you have the integral from zero to one of u prime, v prime, dx, plus the integral from zero to one of two plus sinus x, uh, power 2020, ux, vx, right? So now you want to check if you have coercivity or not, you just replace u and v, they're the same. Plus the integral from zero to one of two plus sinus of x, 2020 ux u square, right? So is it bigger than the integral from zero to one of u prime square?
Is it bigger than the integral from zero to one u prime square? Yes, because yes, right? So so you got it. So Liu's answer is yes. And this is good because the second term is positive, right? The second term is positive because you have u square, two plus sine of x is going to be bigger than one, right? And this is strictly positive. So, so this term is completely positive, which means that you have that bu is going to be bigger than the integral from zero to one of u prime square. In this case, you have coercivity. All right. So in this case, you. So the answer is yes. We can do lax mean gram, and then we can do finite element method. So from lax mean gram, we know that this equation has a unique solution. And, and because you have a solution and this solution is unique, you can design a scheme to solve this equation, right? So if you don't know if, so, so if you know that this equation has two solutions, you cannot design a numerical scheme to solve this equation, right? Because you don't know where the solution is going, right? Um, right, it's clear. Right, so now I'm gonna show you one more example. One over x um, u uh, u x um, and this is f x for all of the x in zero one u zero is equal to u one and they're both zero. All right. So now this equation. Do we have coercivity? Do we have coercivity for this? Uh, so Tyler and Jonathan said that this is no. Who said that this is yes? So let us check, right? So you, you have BUU, BUV will be the integral from zero to one of U prime V prime plus one over X integral from zero to one of UX VX. All right, so, so now what is BUU? BUU will be the integral from zero to one of U prime square plus the integral from zero to one of U square X over X, all right? Is it bigger than integral from zero to one U prime square? Right, so Jonathan got it. So Jonathan said that, uh, so since you have what? Since you have one over X, uh, is bigger than zero. It's basically, this is strictly for all of the x in zero one. All right, so, so this is strictly positive for all of the x in zero one. Um, so this guy is positive, meaning that this guy is bigger than this guy. All right, so Jonathan did a very good answer. But I'm still saying that this is not, so, so however, this equation doesn't have a, um, we cannot apply. Next mean gram. Why? Why, why, why? So, in this case, in this case, in this case, you, you have coercivity, yes? So, a big yes. So in this case, you have coercivity for this bilinear form, but still you cannot apply lax mean gram. Who, who knows why? The reason is is because in lax mean gram you have several conditions, and one of the are, one of the this conditions one is, not is symmetric. This is uh, no, we don't need symmetric, right? Symmetric is fine. Basically, you, you can change the row of u and v. So in this case, this is symmetric, right? But there, there are other conditions. There, there's another condition which is violated. What? Which one is it? The condition which is violated is boundedness, right? Right, so let's, let, let's check. 
right? So I'm saying that the boundaryness in this case is violated. Um, so why? Because in this case, you have V U V is integral from zero to one. You have U prime V prime one over X U V, right? So right. So so you have V U V will be this guy, right? So the first time you know how to prove it, you you know how to bound it, right? So. So in our previous class, you know that this guy is, is by holder, right? So by holder inequality, this is smaller than this guy, and this is nothing but a S01 norm and S01 norm, right? So the first term is fine. It's the first term is bounded because, because you can bound the first term by this, uh, by holder inequality, like, like, like what we did in the previous class, and the derivative, uh, the norm of the L2, uh, L2 norm, the derivative will give you S01 norm, all right? So, so now, now the point is um, the second term, right? So boundedness means what? Boundedness. Boundedness means that when you take the absolute value of BUV, this has to be bounded by beta times u s zero one and v s zero one right so so the, the absolute value of b u v will be smaller than beta times the norm of u and the, times the norm of v the first one is fine the first one we bow this like in in the classical case you do holders and then you have l two norm of u prime then you have the l two norm of v prime this each gives you the S01 norm and this give you the S01 norm. So this is fine. Now for the second term, you have one over X and there is no way that you can bow this by this guy. Because one over X is going to infinity as X is going to zero, right? So, so you, there's no way that you can bow the second term because one over X is singular. It's, this is singular. This is going to be infinity as x is going to zero. So, so, so there's no way that you can bound this integral, right? So in this case, there is no boundedness. Then we can, so there's no Lux mean gram and no finite element method. Right, so someone asks you, okay, can you use the classical Feynman method and you solve this equation? Then the answer is no. Right, so basically, basically for partial differential equation, uh, so this is basically an ODS. So for boundary value problems, uh, not yet partial differential equation, when you change the coefficient, things change, right? So when we change coefficient, Everything changed. And the point is that, okay, you, you, you better um, get an into, if you have an intuition uh, of the un underlying uh, uh, reason why those numerical scheme works, then you can tell in advance that this method is, has no chance to be applied in this case. Uh, in a classical sense, or if you have, you have if you have an improvement, then this is uh, this is something else. But in a classical sense, you cannot apply like finite element methods because you know from the functional analysis class that this equation doesn't have a, a unique solution because the last mean gram theorem um, is violated. All right, any questions? All right, so so basically. Basically, after the whole thing, after the whole thing of the second part of uh, this class, what I want you to keep in mind is the lux mean gram theorem and the finite element method and all of the condition. And you have an intuition why they work. I mean, 
a Dani me comienza. All right, so you don't have to spend time implementing the code because you you can know in you know in advance that it won't work. So there's no uh, there's no reason that to waste time to to code uh, to code it because because um, you know in advance that um, the conditions of the Luxmi Gram theorems are violated. Any questions? All right. So so now. So now let us, so, um, so in the previous class, um, I asked you uh, a homework. Um, I asked you to do the homework showing that, okay, when I have, a, um, so I have HS, which is the piecewise linear, piece, uh, piece uh, wise linear function, right? So you have a, a piecewise. So uh, um, so you have a, an HS, which is the space of the piecewise linear function, which is a subset of zero one, and you divide it into intervals of length h, right? So this is piecewise linear, piecewise linear, piecewise linear, piecewise linear, piecewise linear. So uh, so so this is the homework. Which is due today, right? So this is uh, uh, this is the space of the piecewise linear functions, and I'm saying that show that, uh, and I, I'm asking uh, uh, you to show that um, H H has the basis, which is all of the hat function, right? So this is zero. And then everything else will be zero, right? So this is zero, and right. So so here you have x zero, x one, x two, and this is x n plus one. Right. So, so, so in the previous class, we consider HS to be the space of all of the piecewise linear function, uh, in which you divide the interval zero to one into smaller intervals, and 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 the zero will be x zero, x n plus uh, one will be x, and uh, uh, will be zero, and then you connect all of the points, and then. The, 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 so, so then um, I ask you to consider the basis of n function phi one to phi n. So this function has the following property. So phi i of x j will be zero. So this is x zero, x one, x two. So this is phi one, x three, x four. So phi i of x j will be zero when when i is different from j. And phi i of x i will be one when i is equal to j, right? And uh, so I'm, I'm asking you to show that um, the basis of h s is this guy, right? Right, so, 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 so this is, um, so this is basically the, the most, uh, so if you Google it and you, you go to any, um, Lecture notes on finite element method. You will see the solution. So the solution will be the following. First, you you want to show that this is a basis of this edge, right? So how do you solve it? So what is the definition of a basis? Definition of a basis. Right. So I call this the set B. All right. So so this is a basis of HS if it satisfies the following condition. First, B is linear in linearly independent. Independent. In the sense that if you have what? If you have alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n is zero, then alpha one and alpha n they're all zero. Right? This is the first thing. Right? And then B span HH, B span HH, 
In the following sense, for all of the V in HS, there exists alpha 1, alpha n, such that V can be expressed in terms of a linear combination of all of the, all of the vectors, right? So, so again, this is the homework which is due today. And I'm, I'm, uh, uh, so, and I'm, I'm giving you the solution. So now we try to show that all of the hat functions form a basis to the space of piecewise linear function. And of course, they have to be zero on the value because we are in H01, right? First point, we have to show that B is linearly independent in the sense that if you have alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n is zero, then all of the coefficient will be zero. The second thing you have to prove is that B spans as H in the sense that if you pick any V in HS, which is a, a piecewise linear function, right? Then um, alpha one, alpha n, there it will be alpha one, alpha n, v, so, so that V is going to be written like alpha phi one plus alpha phi two plus alpha phi n. So, so the point is that I'm gonna show you the second point, right? So the first point and se second point, so if, if I can show you, if I show you how to do the second point, you will know that the first one will be the, will be a corollary of, of the second point, all right? So, so now, questions. Um, suppose that you have a, a, a function like this from zero to one, x zero, x one, x two, x three, x n plus one. All right, so, and then you have a function like this. Right, so this is V. And then I'm gonna write V as a linear. So given V, I want to write, I want to write V as V is alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n. All right, so the phi will be, so this is x zero, x one, x two. So this is going to be, and everything else will be zero, right? So, right, so given a, a piecewise linear function in H, H, I want to write V as a linear combination of phi one to phi n. How can I write it? How can we com how can we compute alpha one alpha n? Any ideas how to do this? Uh, I mean, essentially, we can just uh, write down what are the values of V at the points uh, at all the XIs and in and in the intervals of XIs, and then we can show that um, some of the hat functions um, right. at those points are exactly the same. Right. So Surab and 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 Jonathan got it. Uh, idea is the following. So this is a very brilliant idea of, uh, of, of Surab and Jonathan. You have Vx will be alpha one phi one of x plus alpha n phi n of x. So this is true for all of the x in zero one, right? So if you have something which is true for all of the x in zero one, the point is that you choose special value of x, right? Special value of x. So, so now if uh, I choose x to be x1, right? So then I have phi, vx1 will be alpha1 phi1 x1 plus alpha n phi n x1, right? But we know, we know that phi1 x1 will be one and phi2 x1 and phi n x1 they're all zero, all right? So according to the definition of the hat function, 
phi one of x one will be one here, and and phi n of phi j of x one will be zero, right? So if I choose the special value of x x to be x one here, then I have v of x one will be alpha one one, right? V of x one will be alpha one times one plus alpha two times zero plus alpha n times zero. Those guys will be zero. So what do you get? You get alpha one will be v x one, right? Right, so I explain again. You, you want to find all of the coefficient alpha one to alpha n so that v is alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n, right? So how do you choose it? Be so, so, so because this identity is true for all of x in zero one, you have the right to choose special values of x, right? So when x is, is equal to x one, v of x one will be alpha one phi x one, alpha n phi x n, right? Now, but you know that except the first guy, the other guys will be zero because of the definition of the, the basis, because this is a hat function, right? So then Vx1 will be alpha one times one and alpha, so which means that alpha one will be Vx1. Now I'm gonna choose x to be, with, uh, uh, x to be the special value of x2. What do I get? I get Vx2 will be alpha one, phi one, x2 plus alpha two, phi two, x2, alpha three phi three x two plus alpha n phi n x two, right? So again, this guy will be zero. This guy will be one, this guy will be zero, this guy will be one, uh, zero. So basically you, you, get, you get what? V x two will be alpha two. So you keep doing this and you know that V x j will be, Actually, right? So then you can, uh, you can determine f alpha one to alpha n, right? So basically what you get is Vx will be L will be Vx one, V one of X plus Vxn, V n of X, right? In other words, if you give me, uh, is if you give me a piecewise linear function, I can decompose this piecewise linear function into hat functions by by multiplying the phi one with phi x one, phi two with phi x two, phi n with phi x n, right? Now, so which mean that which mean that the second point is proof, right? The second point say that if you pick a v, which is a piecewise linear function, there is alpha one, alpha two, alpha n such that v is alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n, right? And so those, those alpha one, alpha n will be v of, of x one, x two, x n, right? So now, so now, for, so now we have the, the, this guy and suppose that, so, so two is proof. So now we prove one. Suppose that alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n is zero. I want to show that all of the alpha, i will be zero, right? Right, so, right. So again, um, the, the, the second point is proof, meaning that the, the, uh, the set spans the HS space, all right? So now I want to prove the second point. To prove the second point, um, I suppose that alpha one phi one plus alpha n phi n will be zero. How can I deduce that all of the alpha are zero? By the inner product. Uh, inner product is a good way, but uh, I want to do something easier. In the product is a good way, but I want to do something easier. From the previous argument. Right, so you can see, you can consider this zero to be Vx. Right, so the Vx now is the function zero, which means that you have zero is alpha one phi one of x 
plus alpha n phi n of x for all of the x. But Liu said is uh, Liu's idea is is um, is a good idea. Yes. Uh, so so Tianqi's um, idea is is correct. So so Liu idea is also good because you can do inner product. But but here is is simpler than than doing inner product because you can just replace x one here, right? So then you have zero is alpha one phi one, and this is exactly the idea that we just did. So then this one is one. So this is alpha one times one plus alpha two times zero plus alpha n times zero. So everything will become zero. So alpha one is zero, right? So we do the same thing as before, according to Tenchi. Um, so I explain, I explain again, you have what? You have zero is alpha one phi one x plus alpha n phi n x. And I want that all of the alpha one, alpha n, they are all zero. Um, so I can, so according to Tenchi, we, we do the same thing with before. I replace x to be x one. So when I replace x to be x one, this guy become one and the other guys become zero. So then I have alpha one is zero. And by this, by, by replacing uh, x to be x i, then alpha i will be zero, right? So then everything is proof. It's clear. Questions? And 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 basically, this is how this. So what we so far what we discuss is in one dimension, right? So what happened in two dimension? So in two dimension, you're gonna get what? You're gonna get. Um, uh, you're gonna get HS will be a piecewise linear function in two dimension, and the phi n will be will be the same. Will be hat function, um, and then you can you can still do the same thing. But I just I just want to briefly mention this because I don't want to to go uh, into the uh, uh, no. This is x, right? So in n dimension, this guy will, will also be uh, be the set of all of the piecewise linear function, and this y will be also hat function in 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 d dimension, and the same idea apply exactly the same idea apply. So the coefficient will be v at the the point x one to x n, right? Questions. Good. So basically, this is the homework, which is a little bit complicated. So this is the homework. Um, so this homework is different from the previous homework because this homework, you, for this homework, you don't have the uh, uh, the proof in in the in the book. But at least this is the last homework. So so I want you to do some Google. Uh, so the previous homework, you open the book and the solution are there. What you have to do is to read the homework and my. The task to you is to read those details and 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 redo it um, and send it to me. That is easy. This homework, we don't have the solution in a book, but um, if you Google finite element method, you will see this argument everywhere. You can pick pick up any nodes on finite element a finite element a finite element method, and you see this argument. So for this homework, my uh, my request to you is to to Google and find this solution online, all right? So it is, it's a little bit harder, but this is not uh, much harder. Any questions? All right, so, um, so to summarize, to summarize, um, I guess, so there is one more uh, example that I want to, to mention to you, all right? So this is number nine. Um, um, so there's one more example that I want to mention to you. So, so what we did is, is this, um, is to try to solve this equation. And this is true for all of the x in zero one. And then you have u at zero and u at one, they're both zero. All right. So, um, um, so, um, so, so far, what I show you is how to change the coefficient in front of you. Now, suppose that, suppose that I have uh, this equation, u prime x 
plus qx and this is equal to fx and suppose that i multiply with sinus of x here right and you have u0 and u1 they're both zero and this is for all of x in zero one all right okay so so now the difference is, is the is that i put a first order term here so this is a second order the uh derivative and this is a first order derivative this is ux all right so i want to solve u second plus sinus x u prime plus ux is fx and u s zero and u s one have to be zero um so so now now again i want to to solve this equation using laxman gram so then i'm gonna do the bilinear form so the bilinear form will be this And this is going to be integral from f x. Um, all right. Uh, so suppose that uh, this is sinus over four. All right. All right. So do we have coax here? Okay, so my question to you is, do we have coercivity for this kind of thing? So, all right, so, so the first thing that I want to check is coercivity, right? So there are two things to check in, in the business of Laxman gram. Uh, the first thing that I, I always mention is coercivity. Do we have coercivity for this case? Right, so, so to be clearer let me write down the form buu so buu will be integral from zero to one of u square plus integral from zero to one of sinus x over four times u prime b plus the integral from zero to one of u square so do you have something like this right Do we have that? So to about this guy, this guy is, is enough, right? This guy is positive, so who is your enemy? This is positive. This is bigger than alpha u prime, right? Basically, this is u prime square, right? So it's the same guy. So this is your friend, this is your friend, and who is your enemy? The enemy will be the second term. Right? So because this guy is the S01 arm of U, which I want to, to bow that from below by, by alpha, the L2 norm of U prime, right? So this is perfect. Um, the second guy is this guy, which is positive. So 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 they are my friends, right? They are our friends. The enemy is this guy. So the enemy is the integral from this one of sinus x over 4 u prime v. All right? So how can I control this enemy? Excellent. So, so Liu, is, Liu idea is, is very brilliant. This, this is this is amazing so so to borrow the second term the second guy by holder plus overlap this is an amazing uh, idea so so we're going to discuss this uh, on um, monday all right so i put the list of um, of the student um, who, who made the presentation on uh, on canvas basically 
um, there will be two days of four students and uh, one day of three students. All right, so each of you will have like 10 minutes to present. Um, uh, and then we, so of course 10 minutes is not a fixed time because we're gonna, we got all of your friends are allowed to ask questions and I'm also allowed to ask you questions during the presentation. So basically uh, this can last like for 15 minutes, for instance. So if there are a lot of questions, so, but, but if without questions, uh, the, the presentation should be of um, around 10 minutes. And um, of course we, so, so the point is that, okay, after this class, you're gonna get a sense of what is going on between um, how to solve equation and what is the intuition behind those equations. This is the most important thing and the ways are flexible. So, so you will get root ways, but try to, my message to this um, to you is that okay you have to get the intuition right so the intuition is something that i'm trying to explain to you right so not not a form of theorem but but you have to see what is you have to have an, a feeling to 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 all of the quantities inside all of those terms so so in the, your presentation um uh so i encourage you to show your intuition of those knowledge of those uh, inequalities or theorems that you are going to to present all right uh, have a nice weekend bye thank you bye thank you bye thank you thank you